Welcome to the Presbyterian Heritage Center in Montreat. We're having treasures from the attic. These are, this is an opportunity for us to go find artifacts, pictures, documents that are in our vast archives that we've built over the past 12 years. They don't often get a chance to be displayed publicly, and nor do we have a chance often to talk about what goes on when we try and process letters and other kinds of collections that come to us. So today we have a, a wide ranging topic. We're gonna to talk about Montreat things, civil war, uh, church things, and we will see where we go to. And if you have a question, uh, send us a note on Zoom uh, to uh, chat and we will try and get to it as available. <laughs> Nancy Midget, who is a senior researcher at the Presbyterian Heritage Center, has been looking into the men's club. Nancy. Thank you, Ron. So did anybody even know that there was a men's club at one time? Well, where was it? We have a postcard here that shows the men's club and you can see that it must have obviously been by a stream. And no doubt it was in a central location. Okay, so here's your first hint. It was built in 1919. What similar buildings did Montreat have at this time? Well, the girls club, which is still standing, was built in 1916. And it was an important gathering and recreation spot for the campfire girls which was the predecessor to the club program. And over the years, the girls club has continued to be used for recreation. And it's also housed counselors for the club program from time to time. Well, a year after the girls club was built, the women decided they needed a place. So in 1917, the women's club built the Winsboro building for the use of the women's auxiliary. It was named for Hattie Paxton Winsboro, who was the first superintendent of the women's auxiliary. It had office space for the auxiliary. It had a library and most importantly, it had a huge wraparound porch that was ideal for afternoon teas and other social occasions. Now, sadly, this building did not farewell, and it was replaced by a more modern structure in 1960. And then 25 years later, that building was torn down, and what is currently on the site of the old Winsboro building is the Belt Campus Center of Montreat College. But wait, you say, there is a Winsboro building today. Well, yes, so there is. The current Winsboro building was erected in 1937 as the World Fellowship Building, and it was used by the college as a dormitory. When the second Winsboro building was torn down, the name was transferred to the World Fellowship Building in honor of the first superintendent of the Women's Auxiliary. Okay, there was a girls club and there was a women's club. Well, the men decided but they needed a place to gather too. So the men paid for and had built the men's club on MRA property. It had a nice porch, not a porch like the Winsboro building, but then it was by a string. It had a library, not a lending library. They had magazines, newspapers, and comfortable chairs where men could come and socialize. And remember, this was a men's club, so of course there was a pool table and a bowling alley. But don't think about bowling alley in modern terms. You had to reset the pins by hand, and it was a one-lane affair. In 1925, the boys' club was finally built. So we had the girls' club, women's club, <coughs> men's club, <coughs> And the boys club and that building still exists today as well although of course it now houses the curry craft center and sally jones pottery but where was this men's club and what became of it well 
turns out the men didn't use it as much as they thought they would. And as the club program grew, it increasingly needed some indoor space for those rainy days that can often cause the club program to have to change its plan at the last minute. One counselor's diary from the 1930s talks about taking her clubbies on a rainy day to bowl. And that's where it was in the former men's club. <clears throat> because by this time, they had donated that facility to Montreat. But with more and more demands for its use, it was simply too small and too chopped up. So in 1940, the men's club building was torn down and replaced on the exact same spot by a structure that we know today as the barn. Originally, with its wonderful wooden floor, the barn was a skating rink as well as a place for square dance. It had a huge fireplace at one end. It had a small stage. And there were two small offices, one for distributing the skates and one that was an, actually an office for the club program. In the late 1950s, an interesting thing happened at the barn. A wall was constructed to divide off the end of it with the fireplace. That became, for a short period of time, the craft shop. The craft shop had been an assembly inn for one season, but it needed to move out of assembly inn. And so that end of the barn became the craft shop. Fortunately, today, we have a much more satisfactory craft shop. And we have the barn on exactly the location where the men's club had been, where during the summer, the spirit of Montreat Fellowship comes alive every Friday night with the square dance. Except for this year, of course, when the square dances will be held on the tennis courts on Friday evenings. Thank you, Nancy. Um, with live productions like this, you get telephone <laughs> lines ringing and people coming in. So you just have to bear with us. It is, after all, live webcast. Um, we, Nancy, of course, is, does a brilliant job in, in researching, and she's been especially active in looking at Montreat history and working in the early years. But we have other people who are working on other projects. John Hinkle, who's a board member, a longtime board member of the Presbyterian Heritage Center, came in when we had a collection of letters that we uncovered. And there were, I believe, 83 letters from someone who was in the Civil War. And I thought I would turn it over to him and let him tell you about it. John? Thank you, Ron. Uh, yes, I got a call last fall from the Heritage Center. Uh, asking if I'd be interested in transcribing some Civil War letters that had come into their possession from the Foreman collection. And because I was interested in Civil War history and had worked with Ron uh, with the chaplains in the Civil War exhibit, I was eager to have this opportunity. As Ron said, there were actually 83 letters and journal entries written by James R. Ogden of Wellington, Ohio, to his family and friends. Uh, James was 24 years old when he enlisted in the 2nd Ohio Cavalry Regiment, Company H, on September the 9th, 1861, as a private. Uh, the letters are dated from October the 9th, 1861, to December the 19th, uh, 1863. James did not muster out of the service until September the 25th, 1864. So we are missing some letters that he probably wrote home. So we're still trying to locate those. Uh, just as a side note, at the time of his enlistment, he was listed as a freshman at Western Reserve College. So at his, in his freshman year, he dropped out of college to enlist in the Union Army. And what I'd like to do this morning is to briefly read you some excerpts from some of the letters that he wrote back to his family and friends. We do not have the first letter that he wrote, but we do have 
several pages of the second letter, which appeared to have been written in October of 1861. The letter picks up on page two, says someone in company H appeared to have left camp and was placed in the guardhouse, even though he was called a deserter, that was probably just his character. On the 27th, we moved into our new camp on the fairgrounds. Heavy rain and a lot of flooding. We realized why this camp is called Camp Wade. December the 25th, 1861, they're in Camp Denison. My dear friends, thank you for the box just received you for this very Merry Christmas. A very beautiful day. Nelly, Nelly, everyone in the mess has something. Heard from Thomas, who happens to be one of his brothers. He is trying to get a furlough for 20 days, but it will take 12 days to come. $20. If he comes, I will try to come too. December the 28th, 1862, Camp Denison. My dear friends, I have not consumed the sausage or head cheese that you sent a few days ago. We have enough provisions to last several days longer. I have taken several pictures. We'll send you and William one and one to England. So they had relatives in England. What do you think about going to war with England? I hope that will not be done. I've been cooking more than a week and I am lousy. The pictures show what we are armed. The carbon is very good shooting instrument. Our sabers are not very good. I suppose you have heard about the troubles, which was probably exaggerated. Paper was circulated to get signatures to get Captain Lindsay to resign. I refused to sign. January 21st, 1862, he's in Benton Barracks in St. Louis. My dear friends, we are in Camp Benton or Benton Barracks. The first battalion left for St. Charles this morning. We will follow tomorrow. We will take North Missouri Railroad to St. Joseph. This is a large encampment, about 18 regiments of cavalry, six regiments of infantry. There's a great many sessionists out here, almost every night, some of our sentries are shot. One of my regiment had his knee shattered. Another was shot dead. One woman offered some men whiskey and they were poisoned. She was arrested and tried, tried to resist and was shot dead. She turned out to be a man and a spy for the rebel army. February, 1862, Pratt City, Missouri. Dear Mother, have nothing particular to write about, but know you will be glad to hear from me. Sorry to hear about the death of Frank. We have been very busy since we've been searching for sessionists, stores, and ammunition. We have had good luck. Our regiment has taken 600 pounds of powder, 40 to 60 carriages, 12,000 hogs, besides a large number of cattle and a quantity of corn and oats. Weather has been very cold and the roads are solid ice. We expect to receive orders in a few days to move to Leavenworth. Went to church last Sunday. A Missouri minister preached a very good sermon. The text, 2 Corinthians, verses 5 through 10. A number of citizens were present. February 12, 1862, Pratt City, Missouri. My dear friends, not much to report and not much to do because of the state of the roads. Have a guard duty has increased and I'm about every other day. I am well, but a lot of sickness, but overall health is improving. Over the past four days, four men have died. Has not been much bush fighting, but that should increase when more leaves grow on the bushes. Yesterday, our chief bugler of the regiment has his horse shot from under him. We are all anxious to receive orders. Our regiment is in high spirits to leave. The sun is out, the roads are thawing. I received four letters from home today in several newspapers. We continue to live well on our best provisions. 
we have plenty of roast beef and baked potatoes. Have not finished the Wellington butter and bread. Apples are plentiful. Butter is 15 cents a pound, tea, $2 a pound, and coffee, 25 cents a pound. February the 19th, 19, 1862, Fort Leavenworth. Dear Brother William, glad to get your letter. We left Platte City on Saturday. We crossed the Missouri River on ice and found quarters. We should leave the Lawrence, we should leave Lawrence in a few days and then on to Fort Scott. Our Colonel has been appointed to Brigadier General and the 12th and 9th Wisconsin Regiment have been assigned to his brigade. Also our regiment and a battalion of artillery. I think Colonel Doubleday, and we'll know later on that Colonel Doubleday we'll see becomes a uh, Brigadier General and has been contributed of course to the beginning of baseball, which has been defunct, but anyway, so he was assigned to Colonel Doubleday's regiment. Uh, the weather is very cold, a lot of sickness and several have died, 20 more unfit for duty. It rejoices us very much to hear of the recent victories at Fort Donaldson and Roanoke. I hope that our forces will keep the ball rolling until the rebellion shall be put down. I don't think there is anything that will stop us this side of the Gulf of Mexico. And I believe peace will be taken care of before, before we shall be able to get down there. We shall send home those of our company who have died. A hundred dollars was raised to pay expenses. Don't know what to, don't want to see any of our company buried here. February 22nd, 1862. Dear friends, no longer belong to Company H. General Doubleday has been made a Brigadier General, and he wanted two bodyguards, and I was selected as one. We'll no longer have to walk guard duty on these cold hills at night. I like our commander very much. He is a very good officer and very strict. Everything must be done in good order. April 13th, 1862, Fort Scott. You saw in the paper account about Indian fighting under Pierce in the Battle of Pea Ridge. Those Indians have gone to their home and are murdering and driving off the loyal Indians. Large numbers come in every day painted with red and green war paint and carrying hatchets, bows and arrows, rifles and every kind of weapon. Some are in camp now, and they are very fierce and savage in appearance. Very tall men. They ride small Indian ponies, saddles made out of wood and carved rawhide. They generally have some fancy earrings and necklaces. They wear buckskin moccasins and have nothing on their shoulder except a light blanket or buffalo skin. They are willing to trade off a good buffalo skin for a half-size government blanket. They are, they are nearly all Osage tribe. April 13, 1862, Fort Scott. My dear sister Kate, should be noted that he named his horse after his sister. I don't know what that connotation is, but his horse was also named Kate. Talked about how good it is to receive your letter from the family and friends. Not sure we could survive without them. Hope it will not be too many months before we are home. We are all rejoicing to hear the capture of Island Number 10 on the Mississippi. We have had secessionists of, we have success and glorious victories, but they have cost us a great deal, but not more than we are willing to give. I know one young man who was wounded in the same battle. Our regiment has not had the opportunity for getting and getting and receiving glory but we have suffered very much from disease. Many fine fellows have been buried in the regiment is in a better condition than it has been. May the 12th, 1862, Fort Scott. My dear friends, we'll probably be here for another month. The Indian expedition is still being prepared for the troops are beginning to concentrate here for that purpose. There's a good necessity for this expedition for there are 10,000 Indians near Solo 
who are fed by the government and it is very desirable that these be sent back to their country before it is too late to put in the crops. They have mustered in about 2,500 Indians to US service and are attempting to drill them. Their colonel says that all he hopes to expect to do is to be able to herd them. May the 29th, 1862, my dear brother, Alfred, was sorry to hear that you were unwell. My health has been very good. If you, will, if you could live in Fort Scott for a week, you would appreciate the privileges of living in a place like Wellington. There is not a school or church in town. Children are running through the streets without education, and they will not be any better than their parents. The presence of soldiers here does not improve the place. Just heard Double Day will go south from here to Indian territory. We will not all go together because of the foliage is scarce between here and the Indian territory, and the land is uninhabitable by some of our men who were taken prisoners and exchanged on parole said the rebels took them around in the Cherokee Nation and Seneca Nation and treated them with good kindness. One man reported a number of Indians down here waiting for us. The only trouble is that they keep out of our way if we could, if we could find them. August 13th, 1862, Fort Scott. My dear friends, you're probably surprised to see a letter dated from Fort Scott. We found very poor water on the way. When I, write, when I writ, wrote before, I was quite weak from a pretty hard sickness. I have gained strength and have gotten a quart of port wine, which has helped very much. There's a great deal of sickness in the Ohio second. The regiment has buried about 15 within the last few days. The bodyguard has lost three of their best boys, two from diphtheria, one from brain fever. I think the doctor is greatly to blame. It is almost certain death to go to the hospital. I was under the care of a doctor of the 9th Wisconsin. That regiment has lost six men by, by disease, while, while Al has lost 60. July the 29th, 1863, uh, Hickman Bridge, Kentucky. My dear friends, after a short stay in Danville, our regiment, or what part of it is in Kentucky, was suddenly ordered to this place. This was caused by the entrance of a considerable force of rebels, not less than 8,000 men with considerable artillery came into Kentucky by way of London and Richmond, Kentucky. Detachments from several regiments about 160 men from the 2nd Ohio Cavalry had to fight at Richmond on Monday. Our forces were outnumbered, 80 men captured and the rest driven towards Lexington. I don't know where they are now. We have not seen them since they left the regiment on Sunday afternoon. October the 29th, 1863, Knoxville. The rebels are pressing us very closely, and I think fighting must take place in a day or two. If we only had sufficient supplies here, I should not fear a retreat in any emergency. But as it is, I am very much afraid that before you get this letter, you will hear of our retreat, but I hope not. Yet it is not at all impossible. I don't think General Burnside will leave Eastern Tennessee without a great struggle and if he had plenty of rations here, we could hold this country against any force. I believe the advancing force is superior to ours, but we have as good a little army as any of its size in the country. And I believe General Burnside is a good man as the country has. I've had great many opportunities of observing him. And I must say that it is very admirable of him and I respect him. November the 25th, 1863. My dear friends, I've, I have commenced a letter to you, but it's very uncertain whether I shall ever be able to send it. I believe you know that we are besieged, and I believe that it is the first time that the Union Army 
has been in such a position since the war began. Our occupation of East Tennessee has dwindled down to a small point. We scarcely hold the corporate line of the city of Knoxville and the rebel batteries are so close to us that they are continually amuse themselves by throwing shot and shell into the heart of the city. And I am sorry to say that they nearly all strike in the vicinity of our office. I do, I go out sometimes to the fortifications and watch the skirmish. The lines of skirmish of both parties are continually shooting at each other. And sometimes the firing is quite brisk. The enemies are so close that they can send bullets into several streets in town. I heard from pals very close to me. When I was walking out the, near the edge of the town the other day, but there's no excitement. Even the bursting of shells in the street hardly calls out for a, least, uh, for a meek remark. November 26, 1863. My dear friends, this is the 10th day of the siege and Thanksgiving day. I've had a very busy day and I think I shall devote this evening to writing to my friends and family. Probably you're anxious tonight about my safety and comfort. I wish I, I wish you were here to see enough to convince you that all is well and feel as confident as I do that all things are progressing favorably. A large number of men barefooted and without coats and shoes are stalking. The chilly night reminds us of the winter is close at hand and how much the poor soldiers suffer. November the 30th, my dear friends, I have, I have another opportunity to send a letter to by courier who is going to attempt to get through the Cumberland Gap. There is no change in the situation. The enemy made an assault on Fort Sanders at daybreak yesterday morning and met the bloody repulse. Several hundred men were killed and wounded. Several hundred were captured. December the 9th, 1863, Knoxville. My dear friends, I suppose that you will be anxious to hear from me, though you have no doubt heard that the city of Knoxville is no longer besieged. The expected reinforcements have arrived and are now after Longstreet. There is no prospects of capturing him but his retreat into Virginia or South Carolina will be anticipated. When the siege of Knoxville commenced, we had only two days of rations in town. Tonight, there is not a pound of bread stuff in the commissary. Knoxville, and we have less than 400, and we have 400, I'm sorry, we have 40,000 men to feed. There are 700,000 rations about 60 miles from here at a point on the Kentucky River, 30 miles below R London, but it will take at least three days before that portion reaches Knoxville. As I said, this is just some of the letters that, that were written. Uh, it's interesting to note that during the entire war, the second Ohio Cavalry lost seven officers and, a, and 76 enlisted men to, that were killed or either wounded. Again, seven officers and 76 enlisted men were killed or wounded. However, five officers and 179 enlisted men died because of disease. Uh, following the war, uh, James apparently met a young lady in Knoxville when he was there. He married her and they moved back to Ohio where they had five children and he died in 1891. You know, it's amazing what has come into the collection of the Presbyterian Heritage Center. John and I worked on the sesquicentennial of the American Civil War, basically looking at uh, chaplains because there were chaplains from both the Union and from the uh, Confederacy. And here are two blown up pictures. These were originally carte de visite, about the size of your hand. This is Union chaplain, uh, Thomas Salter, who was in the Union U.S. Navy, and he was an Episcopalian. Over here is Robert Franklin Bunting, 
who was a Presbyterian minister. He also served as a war correspondent while he was doing his uh, chaplain service. And uh, he was a Presbyterian and he belonged to the uh, Eighth Texas Cavalry. So you never know what is going to show up in collections at the Heritage Center. They go from religious connections, they go to Montreat, they go to different places. And Mary Stannard's brought, I believe, some uh, hymn books. Hymn books. And since this is Worship and Music Week in Montreat, it's very appropriate. So do you have a microphone and we'll I let you go. I do. And I didn't really come with a prepared speech, but I'd just like to thank Nancy and John for both of their presentations. Those were great. And particularly the Civil War letters, um, why they still resonate so much to us. I mean, it's hard to believe the Civil War ended in 1865, but we're really only one generation away from the war. Uh, Mary Othella Burnett, who wrote the book, Lige of the Black Mount of the Black Walnut, grew up here in Black Mountain. Her mother was a slave, born enslaved where uh, Louise's kitchen is now. And uh, Mary uh, is in her nineties now, the granddaughter of a slave. So really own one, one generation away, and it's hard to think of it in that context a little bit. But thank you, appreciate it. Uh, what I decided to bring today, uh, since it is Worship and Music Conference time, is uh, a bit of Montreat history and hymn books. And Montreat has always had music as a central part of its um, mystery and its spirit. And uh, two items that I have uh, to share with you. One is one of my favorite, and I know the uh, Heritage Center has copies of this, is the Montreat Hymnal from 1916, which I just think is beautiful graphics in the uh, arts and crafts mode. And it was 1916, and the very first hymn is the one by J.W. Chapman. It was written by uh, Harry Baraclaw after a sermon that was preached by Chapman here in the Calvin Auditorium. And uh, I'll see if the other three panelists, if one of them might know possibly what it is. I do, I do. Oh, I was new. I had pretty much a ringer in the crowd here. Ivory palaces. And it has been a favorite in the first of many hymnals over the years, but out of it, my Lord, his garments so wondrous fine, out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe, only his great eternal love made my savior go. So that's one with a unique history to Montreat. And J.W. Chapman was the Billy Graham of his time. And Billy Graham uh, counts him among his theological ancestors with Moody, Chapman, Billy Sunday, and then uh, Billy Graham himself all, well, except for Moody, Moody did not come to Montreat, but the others did. And J.W. Chapman built a house up on Chapman Road and that house has been rehabbed and still stands. Uh, Charles Alexander was basically his equivalent, George Beverly Shea, who sang for Chapman in the Crusades. And George Beverly Shea lived here in Montreat as well, over on Kanawha. But I'd like to share with you something that meant a lot to me in the forward and the aim of the book, written specifically for use in Montreat. It says, a friend once said to me, children get their theology from the hymns they sing. The influence of hymns on green grown-ups is almost as strong. We have tried in this book to use only those hymns whose teaching are in accordance with that of the Bible. So, but I really like that phrase, children get their theology from the hymns they're singing. And I certainly know in my own case that there's a great truth to that. Um, as I mentioned, music has always been part of the worship service here in Montreal. And in 1897, when they had their first conference, their 10 day conference, one of the hymns that they sang was by Saved by Grace. And this hymn was by the noted blind hymn writer, Fanny Cosby. To my knowledge, Fanny Cosby 
never actually came to Montreat. But her hymns were widely sung very enthusiastically, and we all love to sing the more gospel style hymns of Fanny Crosby. And the song that they sang there was Saved by Grace. But we have had other musicians come here as well, ones who came and one who stayed. And the most noted among that were Mr. and Mrs. Crosby Adams. And this is Crosby Adams. This is Mrs. Crosby Adams, who also had a first name. And her first name was Juliet Adams. And she was probably the more, I don't wanna say, the more true professional musician of the two. And she is, gen they moved here in 1913 when they were um, in their 50s for retirement. They both lived here until they passed away in, when they were 91. And they built a house which still stands and is rented. So you can stay in their house, but they came from Chicago and the house is at 136 Virginia Road. And at the time, this book was written in 1997. It was owned by the Hardys. They called it Wonderland. And it was designed by a student of Frank Lloyd Wright. So it was rather modern for the style and even a bit modern for the current. I mean, you'd feel very comfortable in that house. I'm not sure they have air conditioning yet, but they had the other accents. But Mrs. Crosby, in particular, they were very famous in their day, extremely famous. And she is credited with being among the first, if not the first, to see, to write music for children. Prior to the 1800s, mid late 1800s, music was written for accomplished musicians. But I don't know if anyone in this group ever <clears throat> used Thompson's piano, the little red book. I'm not sure she wrote that, but she, she um, wrote in that mode, teaching children to play ch music for children. She and uh, Mr. Crosby never had children themselves, but um, as I say, came here in, in their 50s to retire and both passed away within months of them, each other at 91 and were musicians at um, Gaither Church, now Christ Community Church, but then Montreal Presbyterian Church. She was very much a teacher and uh, they would have conferences here in Montreat. And basically they were very interested in teaching children, teachers, how to teach music in the school. So that school music program that you had uh, when you were growing up in elementary would have come through her spirit and in instilling school teachers and church teachers to incorporate music for children. So I wanted to share those things with you. This is a little book that uh, Elizabeth Pearson wrote in 1995 about the Cosbys. And I think um, other books about her, this is a little book called House in the Woods, which is the book, uh, which is what they called their house over on Virginia. And it's a wonderful story by one of her students. And music was quite different. Harriet Stiles, who was well known in the Black Mountain community, remembered taking music from Mrs. Cosby. As I say, we're not that far away from our distant, so to speak, past, but I believe she said it was a year or two before she was allowed to touch a piano. She used a silent keyboard as the teaching method. So a very different type of structure. So, those are the things that I wanted to share with you today. And Joe and I came here for worship and music conference in 1983 and bought a lot in Montreat, the first time we'd ever been here. And here we are in 2021, residents of Montreat. And so worship and music have been important in our lives as well. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting ready to do our final presentation for the, today. Uh, we'll take the next 10 minutes and talk about something that uh, is unusual, how Montreat interfaced in the world political stage. And to talk about this is Nancy Midget. One of the 
of the more interesting letters that we have in our collection is from a young Chinese girl, Mei Ling Sung. And it was addressed to Jeanette Archer in 1913. We do have the original letters. There's no way I'm going to take these out of the sleeves and you're not going to be able to read them on the camera. Mei Ling spent the summer of 1912 first at the Blue Ridge YMCA and then in Montreat. So how might you wonder, did this young Chinese girl come to Western North Carolina from China at this time? She was a member of a very prominent Chinese family. Her father had arrived in Boston in 1878 at age 12. He lived with an uncle who owned a tea and silk shop. But Charlie, as he became known, wasn't really interested in the tea and silk business. So he stowed away on a Coast Guard vessel. He was befriended by the ship's captain. And when they got to Wilmington, he was introduced to a Methodist minister there. Charlie converted to Christianity. He wanted an education. And so the Methodist church, along with the wealthy philanthropist, sponsored him first to attend Trinity College, which is now Duke University, and then Vanderbilt, where he actually received a degree in theology in 1885. The idea was that he would return to China as a Christian missionary there. And he did this, but his career as a missionary was a bit short. He engaged in a business of printing. He produced inexpensive Bibles that could be sold in the United States, as well as a number of other businesses. He remained a devout Christian throughout his life and was actually instrumental in beginning the YMCA in China. In 1894, a few years after he had returned to China, he became friends with Sun Yat-sen and join the Republican Revolutionary Force. In fact, it was his wealth that financed much of Sun Yat-sen's fundraising. Meanwhile, Charlie Sung married and he had six children. Mei Ling was the fourth child and the third daughter. Sung chose to have all of his children educated in the United States. And in fact, all three of his daughters attended Wesleyan College in Macon, Georgia, although eventually Mei Ling left Wesleyan for Wellesley in 1912. It was in the summer of 1912 that Mei Ling and her older sister, Ching Ling, both then students at Wesleyan College in Macon, came first to the YMCA assembly and met Jeanette Archer. According to Jeanette's mother, who wrote a fairly extensive account of this summer of 1912. The girls, the two Chinese sisters, were so delighted with these mountains that they decided to spend the summer in Hickory Lodge. All who knew them, Mrs. Archer wrote, were charmed with their dignity, keen sense of humor, and intelligence beyond their years. Mei Ling and Jeanette were the same age, 14 at the time, and they became great friends. Mei Ling was in and out of our house all summer, Mrs. Archer wrote. The girls made candy, cooked meals when the maid was out, climbed mountains, rode and drove all over the country. The letter that we have is from Mei Ling to Jeanette in November 1930, 13, when she was at Wellesley. With an excellent command of English, she wrote a letter that is so typical for a teenager. She should be studying math, she said, but she just had to write to Jeanette first. She told of traveling to Boston to see a play, of her living accommodations and working hard. You just ought to see the dark circles under my eyes, she wrote. By the way, Jeanette, my dresses are all down to my ankles and my hair is done up on top of my head in a most grown up fashion. 
She takes nearly two pages to describe her dress for an upcoming prom. Then she concludes, Jeanette, persuade your father to let you come to Wellesley. I'll see that you get in with a wise bunch. Obviously, Mei Ling was a social butterfly, but she graduated with a major in English literature, a minor in philosophy, and was one of 33 graduates to receive the high honor designation of Durant Scholar. Following her education, Mei Ling returned to China, as did her siblings. She moved easily in the society of which her father had become a part. And in 1920, she met her future husband, who was 11 years older than her and married. Following his divorce, the two married in 1927, and this marriage lasted 48 years until the death of her husband, Chiang Kai-shek. She was actively involved in Chinese politics and served as a translator for her husband. During World War II, she traveled widely in an effort to promote the Chinese cause. In 1943, she addressed Congress, a part of which you can see on YouTube today. Journalists at the time referred to her as the most powerful woman in the world. In 1949, communist forces gained control of China and Madame Chang fled to Taiwan with her husband. Following his death, in 1975, she assumed a low profile, emigrating to New York that same year. She returned to Taiwan periodically, once in an effort to regain some political prestige, but unsuccessful, she returned to the United States where she died in 2003 at the age of 106. Interestingly, the sister Chingling, who was with her in Montreat that summer of 1912, became quite famous in her own right. She became the third wife of Sun Yat-sen. In the revolution of 1949, she supported the communists, which led to a break with her family. Remember that Mei Ling and Chiang Kai-shek had removed to Taiwan. She held several prominent positions in the Chinese Communist Party and did not lose favor even during the Cultural Revolution. She died in 1981, some 24 years prior to her sister, Mei Ling. We do have pictures here of Mei Ling and her husband with Christian missionaries in Taiwan. We would love for you to come and see this types of letters, the letters that we have from Civil War. It's an interesting place to come and explore, and we would welcome you this summer. Well, as you can tell, we have a lot of material and are very enthusiastic about it. Uh, to put it in perspective, what we're saying with uh, Nancy's uh, comments was the first lady of the Republic of China both the first first lady and the second first lady summered in Montreat in 1912. There's not many other religious summer conference centers that can make that claim. Look forward to seeing you at the Presbyterian Heritage Center. Have a good day. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>